name is Bill Crane. Our company is CSI Crane. We are happy to bring you this evening planning and be a sponsor for the Atlanta Press Club. I've got two friends up here to my right today. Actually, they're both to my left, but they're, stand they're seated to my right. In more ways than one. Yes. Uh, Tom, Tom Johnson and Max Field, but I'll introduce Tom before he introduces Max. I was a student at the University of Georgia and fortunate enough to see Tom, who was then the publisher of the Los Angeles Times, come up to Athens and give the Drury Lecture. And it, uh, even growing up in a newspaper family, I learned a lot of lessons in that speech and followed his career on to CNN. But I will tell a story on him that I'm almost certain that he's heard that was told to me by John Holloman, who's another UGA Grady graduate. Be, be careful. <laughs> about the kind of boss that Tom Johnson is, and we all hope, and I've been fortunate working for Max, to have a boss like Tom Johnson. But all of you may remember the first Persian Gulf War, and during Operation Desert Storm, Bernard Shaw and John uh, Holloman being trapped in the Al Rashid Hotel as the sky erupted in the fireworks that became the beginning of the first Persian Gulf War. And it was a few days before they were able to get out of there on the one road that was still standing impassable to Damascus, Syria. And they went out in what I was told was a four-car caravan in the dark of night driving to Damascus, Syria. And some interesting things happened along the way which weren't quite apparent to them at the time, but were later again thanks to Tom. They were driving in the caravan, and as they would cross under a bridge, as they were getting closer to Damascus, within moments of passing underneath the bridge, the bridge would explode and no longer exist. So once they were on the other side of that bridge, that part of the road was permanently blocked and there were no more bridges. Now the reason for that, they learned later, was that Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi forces were, were parking the Scud missile launch. A, a portable missile launch. So. Underneath the bridges to avoid our satellite detection. And so they were blowing up the bridges because of what might be underneath them as the road was being passed by these people that they knew later were American journalists. They, of course, the US Defense Department knew at the time. John Holloman and them as the bridges were blowing up didn't know that. So they made a couple of key stops, which you'll hear about in just a moment along the way. And they got to Damascus, Syria, where they were greeted by Mr. Johnson, who said, uh, there's an important phone call I want you to take after he made sure that his, his journalists were safe and sound. And the first call was from General Colin Powell, who explained to them why the bridges were being blown up and what was happening on their way. But then he asked Mr. Johnson to ask Bernard Shaw and John if there was a secure fax line that they had access to when they were there in the newsroom area, they're working in command center. And they went over to the fax machine because John said they made one critical stop that they had to make along the way. And this is in the dark of night in the desert and no light to step out to find a bush in the middle of the desert to relieve themselves. And as they were waiting for this critical fax to come in from the Golden Palace Secretary of State, it was a satellite photo. This is 1993. John said, fortunately, his most important element was not discernible in the photo. <laughs> but his, the top of his shiny head was, and there was a picture of John Holloman taking a whiz in the desert in the dark of night <laughs> on the way to Damascus, Syria. And that was his welcome back from Tom Johnson, who's about to give, I hope, an equal. Well, well I, I, I will only say one thing about that. Uh, by then, the opticals from the satellites had become really quite, quite good. I mean, um, and Max have seen these uh, in the past, but they've improved year by year by year. And, and uh, today, I mean, you, you, they even have sort of three-dimensional abilities from uh, a lot of them. And, and, and including now, uh, all of the low-altitude uh, uh, aircraft uh, that, that are drones and others are coming over. But um, I just tried to keep uh, General Powell and others informed at, on the movement of our people, uh, it was uh, uh, at, on some occasions we would put CNN on the top of the truck uh, because uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, of, of, of military uh, Iraqi uh, equipment along the way, in, including these scuds. Uh, but at night, it was really difficult to determine whether. A four-car sort of caravan going along was made up of Iraqis or Americans, and I will say this: that uh, the, the Pentagon and and others made great efforts to um, make sure that we, we were able to navigate in and out uh, dur during uh, during a lot of that, for which I was 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 very grateful. Um, in introducing uh, my hero, Max. Cleland, I just ask you to uh, per permit me uh, a few very personal reflections. Um, my career in government and in uh, journalism spanned 45 years. 
Uh, during that time, I thought I had seen the best and the worst of politics. I was wrong. When I was a young reporter on the Macon Telegraph, uh, I covered the violence and the hatred that racists of that era directed toward uh, African Americans. I covered the desegregation of the University of Georgia, the des desegregation of the Atlanta uh, public schools, and, 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 and other, uh, and other uh, civil rights activities uh, in, in the South. Late, later, as a young White House uh, aide to President Lyndon Johnson, I heard angry protesters uh, scream, and the quote really was, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Uh, I also watched as protesters attempted to either throw actual blood, animal blood, or uh, red paint on the presidential limo as we would try to travel in different parts uh, of the United States. LBJ, uh, of course, who you know, certainly is in major ways responsible for the war in Southeast Asia, but he confronted angry protesters, uh, hurtful posters, uh, and very mean-spirited uh, editorial cartoons in daily, in daily papers. What was, what was ironic about that is he had us collect them for his library, so they're all there. But while I was at the Los Angeles Times and while I was at uh, CNN, both news organizations covered fierce political attacks by candidates using tactics designed to destroy an opponent. Uh, I've always felt that Lee Atwater was one of the pioneers in that uh, campaign, uh, uh, campaign attack ads, and certainly Carl Rove came along later uh, with his own version. And who among us, particularly in media and politics, can f forget the swift voting uh, of, of John Kerry? Uh, however, never in my 45 years, and I really mean that, in or around journalism and government, had I seen, have I seen a more reprehensible set of attack ads than were used against then Senator Max Cleland in his race for, uh, for re-election. Those ads falsely and reprehensibly linked a highly decorated war hero with Saddam Hussein and with Osama bin Laden. If winning the Silver Star for bravery in Vietnam and losing both your legs and an arm when a grenade explodes near you doesn't qualify you for heroism, no act of patriotism that exists does. However, what what also places Max Cleland on my list of personal heroes, and I have a very, very short list, has been that he has never given up. Never given up. Lesser men, lesser men would have taken their own lives. And I'll just say to you, as somebody who suffered major depression, uh, myself as Max did, and to be just brutally honest, I probably would have. I can't imagine that I could have done what Max Cleland has done with his life. And I mean that with every ounce of sincerity I have, I have within me.